Hello and welcome to the International Crisis Group's online event, Chief Negotiator's Advice, Next Steps on the Korean Peninsula. I'm Duyun Kim, Senior Advisor for Northeast Asia and Nuclear Policy here at Crisis Group based in Seoul. Today marks the 20th anniversary of the first ever Inter-Korean Summit and last Friday marked the second anniversary of the first ever U.S. North Korea summit. Uh, and since the Singapore joint statement, uh, President, U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un unfortunately have not been able to yet implement uh, their vision and pathways towards new relations, peace regime, and denuclearization. And all the while, North Korea continues to advance its nuclear weapons capability. And recently, we have heard some noise coming from North Korea here on the Korean Peninsula. Well, to talk about all these issues, we are in for a treat. We are joined by a star-studded panel of former chief negotiators to almost all of the uh, agreements with North Korea in the past uh, to hear their wisdom and advice going forward. Our speakers have impressive resumes and they do not require an introduction, but I will do one very briefly. Uh, we have Ambassador Bob Gallucci uh, joining us from Washington, D.C., who negotiated the 1994 Agreed Framework. Uh, we have Ambassador Chris Hill uh, joining us at six in the morning, all the way from Denver, Colorado, who negotiated the 2005 and 2007 agreements during the six-party talks during the Bush administration. We also have Ambassador Chun Young Woo joining us from Seoul at nine o'clock in the evening, who negotiated two of the three six party agreements in 2007 during the No administration. And last but not least, we have Ambassador Glenn Davis joining us from Washington, who negotiated the 2012 Leap Day deal with North Korea during the Obama administration. Now, we during the program will take a brief look back, a brief look today, and maybe a further look forward, a deeper look forward, all in just 90 minutes, including Q&A. Now, before we jump in, one housekeeping for our audience, please wait until the q and I know you'll be tempted, but please wait until the Q&A to type in your question, uh, beginning with your name and affiliation, and please a brief question and not a speech. Uh, and we will try to get to as many questions as possible. A post-event recording will be up on our website soon after. Now, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. A very quick down memory lane, Ambassador Bob Gallucci, your agreed framework basically agreed upon uh, North Korea's uh, scrapping their what they were building to be nuclear weapons, nuclear reactors for their nuclear weapons in exchange for two light water reactors, uh, the normalization of uh, economic and political relations, including reducing barriers to um, investment, opening liaison office, eventually exchanging ambassadors, basically. So what was your main negotiations approach or strategy for your agreement? Uh, and what is one thing you are proud of about the Agreed Framework? Diana, I think your summary was uh, perfect. Uh, that's how I would have characterized what we did. Uh, if you ask, uh, anyone asks what the uh, principal objective here was, how do we go about this? Uh, this we got from guidance from, uh, not surprisingly, quite appropriately, uh, from the president and uh, what's called a principals group, the, the, the cabinet, who, uh, who met on this issue. And I would say the most uh, precise about what we were, should be about with the North Koreans was uh, Secretary Perry, Secretary of Defense Perry, who said, we've lived with a lot of problems with North Korea over decades. The one thing that it could change things, the one thing we do not wish to live with is a North Korean nuclear weapons capability. So your job, your negotiation should aim at North Korea's capacity for producing plutonium, which could be used to build nuclear weapons. And that was the focus over a year and a half or so of the negotiations, stopping the five megawatt reactor, uh, shutting it down, stopping construction of the two other reactors, uh, collecting up material that had already been produced and make sure that they didn't produce any in the future. That's what we were about. If you then ask, how did we do? 
Well, for a while, not badly. Uh, the, the reactor was shut down, the reprocessing plant was shut down to separate the plutonium from the spent fuel. And those reactors, the construction of those newer reactors was also halted. So the plutonium production capability of North Korea was frozen at something less, we thought, than the capability to produce a single weapon. Ambassador Hill, during the six party talks, uh, three agreements, one backbone agreement in 2005, very comprehensive, uh, two follow on implementing agreements for each phase of the three, the two phases of the three, so shutdown freeze uh, and disablement phase. Now, uh, the agreed, you know, taking, I, I think that the six party joint statement in 2005 uh, took the agreed framework a bit forward, a few steps forward, no offense, uh, Bob, uh, but it also set up five working groups to deal with outstanding issues, other regional issues that are all intertwined with the nuclear issues. It was not just about nuclear. Uh, it also discussed and agreed upon you know, discussions to begin peace regime discussions at an appropriate time and venue. Uh, so looking back, what was your um, negotiating negotiations approach and strategy, and what is one thing that you are proud of in those agreements? Well, um, thank you for that summary. And as it suggests, it was a rather complex uh, series of agreements and a um, complex time. Uh, my time involved with it came after four years where the Bush administration, frankly speaking, did very little except to repudiate uh, all the good work that people had done before. And so uh, I'm very proud of the fact that we were able to get back into a negotiation and frankly speaking, uh, build on the agreed framework. Now during the uh, uh, Bush administration, agreed framework was somehow a dirty word that you wouldn't uh, that you wouldn't uh, talk about. But in fact, we were trying to do that, and and uh, I think we did su succeed in getting back to some semblance of um, what could be considered at the time progress. The thing I'm probably most proud of is the degree to which we were able to work with other partners. It was a six-party process in mm. in that was not just a um, hollow slogan to it. It really meant something. I worked very closely, especially closely with the uh, the ROK negotiators, negotiators, and it's such a pleasure here to see Chen Hong Wu. We used to take walks around the complex, maybe a little concerned that the Chinese were otherwise listening to us, but we really did have a sense that the US and the ROK were in this together. We needed to work very closely together. And coming during a period of history when the uh, US and ROK had kind of drifted apart a little, we had had all kinds of bilateral issues, very proud that we brought that together. Secondly, and I believe this to this day, we, we're able to establish some patterns of cooperation with China. And anyone who thinks that um, it's, uh, you know, we should not work with China because it's too hard to work with China ought to try working against China. And that's frankly what we're doing right now. And so I think the ability to work with China and to try to do things together, I think was very important. And as for the actual agreement, I think getting people back on the ground and sort of seeing what it looked like, uh, trying to shut down plutonium and keep the door open to further investigation of the uh, uranium enrichment was the way to go. And uh, the problem was that uh, when uh, the North Koreans started having their leadership problems and started kind of facing what they were actually dealing with, they pulled back. Uh, so I don't think it was the format. I don't think it was the problem of uh, successive administrations in the U.S. I think the problem is that North Korea is not is not committed to this process. Thank you. And, and you know, I, I think it's important to note that during the six party talks, the U.S. and South Korean alliance was at one of its lowest points in history. And yet, as you mentioned, you and your counterparts uh, for former foreign minister Song Min Soon, and then afterwards Ambassador Chun Yong-wu, you were able to work together very well um, and almost, almost in lockstep on the ground. Uh, Ambassador Chun Yong-wu, from a South Korean perspective and your own pro professional perspective, uh, what was your negotiations strategy and approach going into this party talks? Uh, and what is one thing that you are proud of in the agreements that you negotiated? Well, uh, Ambassador Chris Hill spoke for me <laughs> in terms of negotiating <laughs> strategy and, uh, and uh, modality of negotiations. Um, well, I, in terms of strategy, I thought that uh, denuclearization cannot be done overnight. So we took, uh, I, I, I recommended uh, a three-phase 
approach to denuclearization. So I was involved uh, uh, from uh, February 2006 in the Six Party Talks for a little more than two years. And most of the negotiations actually took place uh, during my time in the Six Party Talks. And that's mm -hmm. uh, largely due to our very close uh, you know, working relationship with uh, Chris Hill, uh, with our Japanese colleagues. So the three countries stood together in our strategy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, deeply involved in the first phase agreement, uh, you know, which is uh, a February 13th agreement uh, in 2007. That was about freeze and dis uh, disablement of North Korea's plutonium program and declaration. Mm -hmm. The second phase would be removal of fissile material and or weaponized uh, nuclear devices from North Korea. And uh, third phase would be, uh, in my strategy, dismantlement of the, uh, the facilities because dismantling facilita facilitates long time. So we have to remove the fissile material that can be used for nuclear weapons immediately. So I, I thought that we could uh, uh, do this uh, before dismantling the facilities that produce fissile material. So actually, mm -hmm. after the first deal on the first phase deal on uh, freeze and dis uh, disablement was uh, uh, worked out, I began to uh, talk with my North Korean counterpart, Kim Ge Wan, about what we should do about the second phase deal, the removal of fissile material. Uh, he, he wanted uh, uh, dismantlement of the facilities as a second phase. I insist on hmm. removal of fissile material that can be more readily usable for nuclear weapons uh, in terms of uh, second phase. We will talk later about the LWR, light bulb reactors, but I think I, uh, one thing, one advantage I had uh, compared to other uh, colleagues in the six party talks was that I had the best uh, kind of communication with the Kim Ge Wan, North Korean counterpart. Mm. It's, it's always very difficult, even now, to communicate with North Korea, to make sense of what they are saying. Mm. So unless we, we actually understand what they mean when they, when they you know, come up with a, a proposal or a claim, <laughs> it's very difficult to move forward. So uh, I think my, uh, my role uh, that others could not uh, play was uh, to facilitate communication with North mm. Korea, and to interpret what Kim Ge Wan was saying in uh, conferences or in bilateral discussions, so that other, you know, other friends, other colleagues in the Six Party Talks could understand what North Korea was up to. Right, and that's a key, that's an important point. We'll get to more of that later, where South Korea plays that type of role because South Korea does understand both sides. But you did mention an important point about how Kim Gyeongwon wanted to dismantle some facilities before um, taking out some fissile materials, and, and I think this theme will come up, and it even actually um, is a reoccurring theme today. I I, I feel like moving on to Ambassador uh, Davies for the 2012 Leap Day deal. Um, you know, basically, uh, you know, that was negotiated barely two months uh, after Kim Jong-il died, so barely when Kim Jong-un was beginning his succession. Uh, and basically, you know, there, no, there was no agreed published text like in the previous uh, agreements, and both sides kind of released their own versions of what was understood or thought to be, have been understood. But basically, the deal seemed to be that North Korea would suspend its uranium enrichment program at Yongbyon, uh, stop nuclear missile testing, allow IAEA inspectors back uh, in exchange for about 240,000 tons of food aid. But it was soon botched when North Korea uh, launched what it, it called a satellite into orbit, what the U.S. calls a missile, which... Um, breached the agreement, the Leap Day agreement. Uh, so with that happy outcome, uh, what was your negotiation strategy going in? And what is one thing um, that you're proud of, of that deal, even if it may not have materialized? Yes. Well, first of all, Diana, it's great to be here. And thanks for uh, having me. Uh, this is an important gathering and an important time to talk about this stuff. Uh, Leap Day was very different from the other undertakings because mm. it was uh, it was by design, exploratory, and preliminary. What we hoped uh, 
was to achieve these parallel kind of unilateral pledges that, that would lead back to six party talks. Right. Uh, we wanted to know, is the DPRK's new leader serious about going back to, to those talks? Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> because we knew that any durable agreement would have to be negotiated multilaterally in, involving uh, the neighbors. I, you know, I think uh, uh, what we were proudest of <clears throat> in this was uh, that uh, North Korea committed to a uh, moratorium on production of nuclear weapons grade uh, material and a moratorium on missile testing. Uh, but above all, I think I was proudest of the fact that we got, we secured a uh, North Korean uh, undertaking, a specific undertaking to invite uh, IAEA inspectors back into uh, North Korea. Uh, that was, I, was meaningful and, and, and substantive. But of course, of all of these agreements we're discussing today, Leap Day had the shortest half-life. It mm. didn't last very long. And I know we're going to talk about in a second why Leap Day was, uh, was such a brief, uh, hopeful period uh, right after the ascension of Kim Jong-un, who was described by some as a, a new breath of fresh air. One uh, American mm. commentator even called it a Camelot moment uh, in a reference to Kennedy, and I thought that was excessive. Oh, wow. But in any event, uh, it, 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 uh, it did answer a few questions about this new youngest leader in the world, Kim Jong-un, uh, what was he prepared to do? Uh, and sadly, uh, of course, it all came crashing down. And look where we are with Camelot today. Okay, let's do a very quick rapid fire uh, round here. One word answer, if possible, if not half a, a sentence. What is one reason, just choose one, I know there's a lot, one reason why your agreement broke down? Ambassador Lucci. Trust. I know it's tempting, there's a lot. Trust, sorry. You wanted one word. Excellent trust, Ambassador, Ambassador Hill. Uh, two words, uh, North Korea. Okay, Ambassador Chung. Yeah, North Korea is cheating. Three words. Three words. Yeah. <laughs> Keep adding them on. Okay, Ambassador Davies. Um, the leader wasn't ready. That's what happened. He wasn't ready for prime time, Kim Jong-un. Wasn't prepared to okay. go forward. Hmm. And I think some of the Trump administration officials might agree with you on that even today. But uh, let's dig a little bit deeper, but also very briefly to going back to from a great framework to six party talks, a great framework, light water reactors were promised and we were building them. Um, and then the Bush administration comes in with um, an ABC policy, basically anything but kill Clinton. Uh, and also, I remember Ambassador Hill, you told me the motto back then was no LWRs until pigs fly. I Why know, was I that the case? That. Whoa, whoa. But you, you mentioned that there was a saying. <laughs> may, it may not have been yours, <laughs> but there was uh, that was, saying. It was uh, Bob Joseph. Yeah. And, and, uh, okay. He had the view that we, they, the North Koreans should essentially strip to their underwear and surrender. And uh, I felt that was totally unrealistic, and I felt it was unrealistic mm. to take LWRs completely off the table. Uh, mm. We did, however, say we we're prepared to discuss a North Korean civil nuclear program at an appropriate time, which we defined as meaning when the North Koreans came back into compliance with their obligations as a member of the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty. So that um, uh, wonderful quote of yours is something I have never uh, used myself. Oh, oh, okay. Not yourself, but I, okay. Uh, Ambassador Bob Gallucci, your reaction to some, in some factions and some quarters of the administration did not want to provide light water reactors. Um, it's unclear where the Trump administration stands on this. What is your um, thoughts on light water reactors today and going forward as part of a deal? Civil nuclear energy program. My own view is that what we were searching for with the light water reactors back in the 1990s was something that would make the deal work. What did the North Koreans really need, want, before they would give up the plutonium program? I mean, we were not thinking highly enriched uranium. We 
We weren't thinking Pakistani centrifuges. We weren't thinking North Korean cheating. We were focused on what was in front of us. And the chief negotiator, Kang Suk Ju, uh, told me in a, in a meeting with just our interpreters that what he wanted in answer to my question was he wanted light water reactors. He wanted that program. Uh, and so I went after that as an objective of what we would put, try to put on the table. Uh, and there were bumps here and there. There were concerns about who's light water reactors, South Korean or Americans. There were concerns about uh, whether light water reactors produce so much plutonium, they're worse than the current uh, gas graphite reactors of the North Koreans. There were technical arguments, political arguments. But for me, as I think I said, uh, the objective here was to stop the plutonium program. And uh, light water reactors are more, to use the phrase, proliferation resistant, kind of like water resistant wristwatches, uh, than, are, than is the gas graphite program. So that's why we did what we did. And I have said, you know, he, he, Chris may not have said when pigs fly, but I did say if they wanted 100 Mercedes Benz, I would have gone after 100 Mercedes Benz. I was looking to make a deal that would stop the plutonium program. Yeah. And if you say, would, would we look again, if that's the second part of your question, at nuclear energy for the North Koreans, I would, in fact, do that if it meant we would fully stop a nuclear weapons program and would do everything we've talked about in terms of taking things apart so they'd have to start all over again. Um, if that's really what you get for this, and in, in return, mm -hmm. you get light water reactor technology and they don't have enrichment and they don't have reprocessing, then that still strikes me technically and politically as a good idea. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have any apologies for having, having done that. I think it was the right thing to do at the time. And I would explore it again if it seemed to be the key to an agreement that got the denuclearization we wanted. Right. Ambassador Chan, Kim Jong-un in his New Year's Day address last year uh, stressed uh, atomic energy, I think that was a Korean word, but nuclear energy or nuclear power as uh, one of the areas that his country needs to focus on and develop. Do you think North Korea would does that signal to you that they're still interested in receiving uh, or having a civil nuclear energy program and receiving some sort of assistance from the outside for those facilities and technologies? Or uh, would small modular reactors perhaps be um, a bit safer, technically feasible, politically feasible? And all of this in the context of South Korea's position, especially when the Moon government today is trying to phase out nuclear energy in South Korea. How does this all work out together? Well, I still believe that North Korea believes, uh, North Korea believes that uh, nuclear energy, civil nuclear energy is the best way to resolve their uh, electric power supply problem. The biggest mm -hmm. problem in North Korean economy is uh, shortage, short supply of uh, electric power. Until they fix that problem, there is no hope for economic development. So they believe that this is the, the best uh, solution for their electric power problem. So, uh, but you know, domestically, ROK, uh, present moon is opposed to nuclear energy, expansion of nuclear energy in this country. But I don't mm -hmm. think they will, they will object to uh, uh, building, uh, providing uh, light water reactors in North Korea if that is a solution. Uh, not only for North Korea's energy problem, but if it solves nuclear issue, why not? And let me go back to this uh, uh, LWR issue that you mentioned Business? Uh, <laughs> yes. earlier. Uh, no LWR until peaks fly. That's what Bob Joseph told me. And uh, so, so uh, when uh, Bob Joseph came to me for a farewell visit, uh, a gift I made for him was uh, uh, a glassware pig with uh, wings, uh, a, a flying <laughs> pig. Uh, so we had uh, we had discussion about uh, LWR for quite a while because when I talked to Kim Gae Kwan in the Six Party Talks, I realized uh, that he attaches North Korea attaches an outrageous value to LWR, and. The extent of the value they attach to LWR becomes our leverage in negotiation. So I thought that if we play this card right, 
we have a better chance of uh, uh, making progress in denuclearization. So, so I knew that uh, the Republicans were uh, not very fond of uh, you know LWR. So I went to uh, Bob Joseph. I know Chris didn't like it, but I, I still uh, wanted to talk to him. And Are you I, with me? <laughs> so what I what I told him was that uh, it is best if we can denuclearize North Korea with LWR. But if mm. uh, if North Korea is not going to denuclearize without LWR, I thought that uh, denuclearize North Korea with LWR is better for us than uh, nuclear armed North Korea without LWR. His answer was uh, no LWR until pigs fly. That was his answer. But <laughs> uh, when I, you. <laughs> okay. in my discussions with Kim Gyeong uh, mm -hmm. about second phase denuclearization, uh, he still insisted on LWR. He, he considered provision of LWR as a, a specific token of U.S. abandonment of hostile policy. Peace regime mm -hmm. is our, just a piece of paper that you, know, you can just uh, tear away anytime. But LWR is a real thing which requires huge financial commitment. So this, they will take it as a, a concrete token of uh, abandonment of U.S. hostile policy. And he even talked about putting all fissile material and nuclear devices in one location that we designate, five parties designate, like a, a Chinese embassy compound in Pyongyang for the, for the other parties to monitor, to keep their Chinese black box LWRs come online. So you cannot remove them until the LWRs are completed we'll be ready to put all these fissile material, those things in a location that you designate. And mm. you can monitor them, you can keep them. Just, just keep them within North Korea. That was his idea. But uh, well, there are more things to, to do about denuclearization, but that was a very interesting idea. And I thought that uh, denuclearization, uh, LWR could give us a chance uh, mm. to, to move forward on the path to denuclearization. And that's uh, you wanted if, to... If, yeah, if North Korea attaches the same importance to LWR, I think there is still a chance to look into this card. Ambassador, you wanted to jump in here, but very briefly, please. Sure, some of this issue of the LWR speaks to the fact that within the Bush administration, there were really sharp divisions about pursuing the negotiation. I was a career foreign mm -hmm. service officer charged by the Secretary of State and by the President to pursue these negotiations. I would have loved to explain to the North Koreans why we want them to get rid of nuclear weapons, have them hit the side of the head with the palm of their hand and say, now we understand and we'll do it immediately. Unfortunately, that's not how it worked. And I think Young Wu's point is very true. They wanted some concrete example of, of how our hostile policy is at an end, our so-called hostile policy, and therefore they wanted to see an LWR, which at the time was the best example or best way you could get them electricity uh, without uh, you know, being, as, as Bob said, uh, like a, um, like a, a water resistant watch, it would be more difficult to divert that to, uh, to weapons programs. But I think it's important to understand that we had people on our side who hated every aspect of this negotiation and uh, would always look to subvert the negotiations by putting more demands on the North Koreans and, uh, and not agreeing to, to any sort of effort to, uh, to kind of meet them halfway on any issue. So it was a, it was a tough time. Let's stay very briefly on this, on six party, uh, the cooling tower, Ambassador Chun and Ambassador Hill, how did this idea of blowing up the cooling tower come up uh, and how do, how were you able to convince North Korea to go along with it? Well, the idea is uh, uh, Ambassador Hill's. He owns the patent right to the idea. <laughs> I was responsible for marketing this idea to Kim Gye Kwan. Ah. So yeah, what I was told him was that, uh, you know, people don't understand what this uh, disablement is all about. We don't see, 
yeah, we were we were cutting the pipes or you know breaking some parts of the 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 graphite moderate reactor or uh, reprocessing plant, but it's not feasible. So if we are going to gain public support for this um, six-party process, the the deal that we worked out, you have to show something visible that people can really see and understand. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I, I, I did the errand for Chris Hill. Is, you know, is that correct, Martin, Ambassador Hill? Is this story accurate? <laughs> for this idea. You know, everyone has a little of Donald Trump deep inside them. And uh, that was my Trump moment when I realized that all of this sawing off of uh, exhaust pipes, et cetera, didn't really mean anything to anyone. So let's have one big show. So I, I explained to, uh, to the, the Chinese, uh, to Wu Da Wei, that we needed a sort of moment to show uh, what this was all about. So I, I had some note, notes in front of me, so I, I rolled them up. And he said, what do you mean? I said, we need to... Uh, uh, take down the cooling power, a uh, cooling tower like this, and I smashed my notes on the table, uh, having spindled them. And uh, Wu Dawei said, "I understand." And uh, later on, when it actually happened, and by the way, I was not even allowed to go because Condi Rice was worried that Bob Joseph and others would come after me because they would claim that the mm. cooling tower didn't really mean anything, et cetera. So I couldn't even go and watch it. But President Bush was watching it on television in the Oval Office, and he pointed at the television and he said, you know, that's verifiable. And that was the point. We had verifiable <laughs> disablement right there. Okay, so for better or for worse, it seems like North Korea under Kim Jong-un is taking a page from that time by blowing up the entrance to its Pungeti nuclear test site and offering to just dismantle yeah. or blow up some parts of other facilities. Uh, so I guess we owe that all to you, Ambassador Hill. Well, I, I, would, I would make the point that when you do these grand gestures and it's a little circus-like, you don't do it twice or three times and you don't pretend that something is something that it's not. And so, uh, no, I'm very skeptical of these actions that the North Koreans have taken, very skeptical that they are at all interested in pursuing a path of denuclearization. I think the blowing up the cooling tower only made sense in the context of several steps they were taking to, um, to comply with the, uh, with the February 2007 agreement. Let's move on to the Leap Day deal. Ambassador Davies, uh, if I may just pick one small bone with you, why was, okay, what happened to Space Launch Vehicle? Why did, was that not explicit or maybe there was an interpretation difference or a different understanding between the two sides. Uh, mm. What was the discussion like leading up to that? Uh, in yeah, that's become and the then they botched that, the deal with... Right, people yeah. focused on. Look, we made it plain uh, to Kim gae -gwan. I told him a couple of times, more than once, so much that he got impatient with me, uh, that we would consider any violation of UN Security Council resolutions, including, and I mentioned specifically, an SLV launch. Uh, an act of bad faith that would end the deal. And he, he acknowledged that. He says, okay, I got it. That's, gonna, that's going to uh, end the deal. Now, we decided not to parse that out in the language uh, because uh, these were meant to be brief public statements, um, the whole point of which were to judge each other on our actions going forward. And we talked about that. I explained to him that we wanted to, mm. this isn't about these parallel statements we're making. Uh, so much as it is what we do afterward. Uh, and of course, when they announced that they intended to launch that rocket on the Day of the Sun on April 15th, um, what happened? Seoul, Beijing, Tokyo, Moscow, Washington, and a lot of the international community came down on North Korea like a ton of bricks, and they all called on them not to go ahead with it. And then when they went ahead and launched all uh, on April 15th, the whole world uh, knew exactly what it was, that they were blowing up chances for, uh, for a deal going forward. Yeah. I'd like the audience to remember this point with SLVs or satellite launch, because this still is a theme today. Uh, and we are suspecting, many of us are suspecting that North Korea might um, be preparing for another type of satellite launch. Uh, but before we move on to the next section, very briefly, again, in 
maybe a word or half a sentence with all the major caveats of you had you have no you have you do not have 100% control over negotiations you do not have 100% control over all the factors that go into it especially north korean negotiating behavior domestic politics geopolitics and all those caveats included uh, what is one bone you would like to pick with your predecessor or successor about their agreements ambassador galucci I thought uh, my successor's agreements were all perfect. Um, so I don't have any complaints. No, it, it actually- You're allowed I, to be undiplomatic just once. I, I don't, a, a bit ago when uh, uh, Chris was responding to one of your questions, he's, yeah. he gave a two word answer, North Korea. Um, I think that, and he also I think was accurate ab about the first four years of the of the Bush administration, uh, it took them a while. But you know, when Chris got involved, we were seriously interested in doing a deal. And when uh, Ambassador Chun was involved, we were looking by 2007 to do a real deal. So I really think we're talking about the readiness of the mm. North Koreans to do what they knew we needed them to do, and that included verification. So I don't actually have bones to pick with our negotiators uh, after this, including Glenn, who I, I know I, I was mystified a little bit about, about that as an outsider looking in, but I, I take him at his word. And I think as was true before that, the North Koreans were not ready as they may not be now. Ambassador Hill, your, your bone, undiplomatic bone to pick. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I don't really think I can answer your question. I think the Obama administration yeah. really tried to take it up, tried to take it up quickly. I mean, you know, every negotiator has different tactics. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there was too much concern that somehow Kim Ge Guan was too low level and they had to go to Kang Seok Ju. Uh, I think, you know, in North Korea, the only person who counts in one of these meetings is the note taker. Uh, because it really has a tendency to go right to the top. But I have no criticism of my okay. successors. And I, I'd like to say one other thing that with regard to Glenn's uh, uh, Leap Day agreement, we gave nothing. We gave absolutely nothing. Uh, it was the North Koreans who essentially uh, ruined it uh, to their detriment. I mean, they lost things. We gave absolutely nothing. And yet the criticism uh, that we heard in the in Washington for the various chattering classes was somehow U.S. duped again, U.S. fooled again by the North Koreans. We gave absolutely nothing. And I think it speaks to the fact that there's a whole coterie of people in, in the United States who just do not understand the concept of negotiation. I mean, they understand the concept that in baseball, if you get uh, uh, one hit out of three times up, you're pretty good. And yet they look at uh, negotiations as something we should be batting a thousand, if you can forgive the ba baseball metaphor. We don't play that anymore in the US, but Korea does. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's really, you know, Americans, as we go forward, we're gonna have to look much harder at the fact that negotiation involves a two way street and you need to give up things to get things. Ambassador Chan. Well, um, I don't know if there is a, a bone to pick, but uh, uh, I thought that uh, North Korea was not ready to declare mm -hmm. and give up their enrichment program. The reason why they were willing, they were committed to denuclearization in the September 19 joint statement, 2005 joint statement was that they were confident that they could conceal their enrichment program to the end. So uh, when they talked about denuclearization, that meant abandonment of plutonium program because they could, they could hide, conceal mm -hmm. the enrichment mm -hmm. program uh, without being detected. But uh, when the moment of truth came that they had to declare and you know, U.S. found out traces of their enrichment. Uh, I think we should be, the negotiators should have been ready that North Korea would be cheating at some, at some point down the road. And you shouldn't be panic. You shouldn't panic. You shouldn't uh, be surprised when they cheat. North Korea cheat all the time when there's chance. So take it as just business as usual. Oh, you, don't tell them that you are cheating. 
you missed you missed a line or you know you missed uh, you misspelled or a typo error in your declaration so just keep them uh, a way out you, you just uh, take on them so that they can rectify you know mm -hmm. not being embarrassed mm -hmm. for for being cheating not being embarrassed for be being caught red handed so i think that uh, there was a better way of dealing uh, when North Korea was caught cheating on enrichment mm. program. So when they were cheating, oh. when they were caught cheating, and when when uh, U.S. was ready to take on them, then they didn't know what to do. Just they ran away. They ran away, and the only thing they had to do was to run away and hide, not to come out again. Then perhaps the lesson here is a small, a, a small cultural nuance lesson, perhaps in, in negotiations. Uh, Ambassador Davies, real quick. No, I would just associate myself with what's been said before. I think that's I, I, I agree with all of that. Okay. Let's uh, move forward to the Singapore agreement. Uh, very briefly, what is one thing that you think was done right with the Singapore joint statement between Trump and Kim? And what is one thing very briefly that you think could have been done better? Just choose one. I know there could be a lot. Anyone can go first. Okay, if there okay is... I feel like Ambassador <laughs> Hill, you look like you want to go first. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, um, there had been a long hiatus. Uh, there hadn't been any serious talks in a while. Uh, we'd gone through a particularly uh, difficult time with repeated nuclear tests and uh, long range missile tests. So uh, I think probably uh, it was okay to have the president take a, a direct role in this. I think it uh, was intended, it's, it was more than just a, a talk, it was a real effort to deal with the North Korean accusations of our hostile policy, et cetera. And I think uh, one some credit for the US and the world as a country willing to take some risks. So, you know, I, uh, I know a lot of people said, wait a minute, you can't start with the president. Once you start with the president, there's nowhere to go, et cetera. And, and I, I share that uh, concern. But I guess my, uh, uh, so that's the one good thing, or maybe I'll put that on the positive side. The bad stuff though had to do with the the endless lack of planning, the lack of seriousness, the marketing of this thing without really looking at the, uh, the actual facts of the negotiation. And then when President Trump started blurting out North Korean uh, uh, propaganda lines to the effect that uh, U.S. South Korea, I mean, he even learned to speak a little North Korean. Instead of U.S. South Korean military exercises, he referred to hostile war games. Uh, and that at following a 45 minute meeting with, uh, 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 with, with the North Koreans. So I'm, I'm really, um, I, I feel it's become, it's repeated itself as farce. And I think mm -hmm. if there's any going back, uh, we need to uh, really try to uh, think of this as a bad fever dream and kind of move on with a, a new approach. But, you know, at least they did something, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Ambassador Davies, yes. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think uh, I have a, a bit of a unique perspective because I was sitting in Bangkok as our chief of mission mm -hmm. during mm -hmm. the pressure campaign leading up to it. And at least from that, from the perspective of uh, the view from the field, I thought the pressure campaign was doing a great job. I mean, I thought it was uh, rallying the international community in a way that uh, we had quite achieved before. We were beginning to you know, close off some of these ways that North Korea was using to evade the sanctions, exporting labor and so forth. And I think what went wrong was uh, that we pulled the plug on that a little too early for what turned out to be uh, th this kind of, uh, uh, you know, showpiece of Singapore that had not been thought through, had not been properly prepared, and there was no thought to step two and step three. Mm. Ambassador Galici. Oh, I, was that your hand or no? Yeah, well, sort of. I mean, I think, 
I think these guys have it right. <laughs> I think there was uh, some people uh, were very upset if the president had left over the standard operating procedure for State Department negotiations of this kind, which is let experts do the hard work. And as some, it comes at the end, maybe for the signing ceremony, but you don't have nothing on the table and then have the two leaders come together and expect to get uh, a roadmap to anything useful. Um, however, as, as Chris pointed out, we, we if this was going to break a log jam and, and this blowing up this particular cooling tower was going to be helpful, you know, that the imagery, then sure. Uh, but the idea was, I thought that, you know, we had a very capable guy who's now the Deputy Secretary of State, Steve Began. Um, uh, he could go on from the American side with an expert team and meet an expert team from North Korea and do the work. Um, and apparently, there was some of that w went on before Hanoi. And, and then they blew up another cooling tower um, instead of act, taking advantage of that work. So I, I, I think uh, what we could say is that this symmetry, there may be a place for symmetry, but you ultimately are gonna pay a price if the hard work of the details of normalization, the details of denuclearization aren't worked out at, a, at the working level. Ambassador Chun. Yeah. <clears throat> one good thing and one the, not so good thing. One, I, it's very difficult to find anything right. I think there's one thing right is uh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, an agreement on recovering the remains of the uh, American you know, POWs and MIA. I think that's the only thing positive I can I can see in the joint statement. But if you look at the joint statement, it looks as if it was dictated by North Korea. Yes. yes, it reflects very faithfully yeah. North Korea's long-standing arguments. Their logic, yeah. long-standing. Their logic is that uh, U.S. hostile policy is the root cause of their nuclear armament, right? If U.S. didn't pursue uh, what they consider as hostile policy, they, they had no reason to develop nuclear weapons. So if you give up your hostile policy. We have no reason to keep our nuclear weapons. That logic mm. is precisely reflected in the in the in the joint st statement, especially in the sequence of the commitments. Mm -hmm. So the sequence is you know new U.S. deputy relations, peace regime, security guarantees. Then, so these three things are specific outcomes that U.S. has committed to. And uh, the only commitment that North Korea made was to commit to work towards complete denuclearization of, North, of the Korean Peninsula. So it's not a, it's it's just a, not about the commitment to the to an end result. It's a commitment to the process to process. Mm -hmm. Whatever I'd have to, of the yeah. process. So. I'd have to, so I'd have to agree with you too there. Wrong is yeah. with the sequence, putting the sequence in that it, order. That, exactly. That legitimizes North Korea's logic, reflects North Korea's logic. And now what North Korea tells U.S. is, you know, abide by the agreement. You sign, signed on to this. Why don't you implement your share of the deal? And so it's not just... After, Right. It's not just legitimizing their rationale and logic, but it's also, in North Korea's eyes, setting America in stone by having to follow that sequence of negotiations. So they first have to discuss well, the relations, then North peace. Korean, the yes, most from North Korean sequence. perspective, yeah. They and then always, denuclearization yeah. comes last, yes. yes. They have been now, always focusing on this uh, sequence in, their, in all their arguments. Yes. So that's, that's Ambassador, very important. Ambassador Hill. Yeah, real quick, I, I do want to put in a word for sort of symbolic gestures, and I think the gesture of meeting them, while it was certainly controversial, was an effort to kind of kickstart things, but it was the complete lack of uh, follow-on and, and frankly, an inadequately prepared summit that I think uh, has turned it into a bit of a uh, process, a bit of a farce. And uh, one other point about the cooling tower, since it keeps coming up, 
it was only valuable as a symbolic gesture in the context of something like 11 or 12 other very concrete uh, efforts to disable the reactor. And since no one understood these concrete efforts and we had a lot of criticism about them, things like you could, uh, you know, we had a certain things that were taken apart and our critics, Bob Joseph and John Rood and others were saying, well, you can put them back together in the speed it took, in the time it took you to take them apart. The cooling tower was a symbol, but also a part of an overall effort. So when you have symbols that are not parts of overall efforts, you have kind of hollow gestures. And I think to a great extent, that is what happened in Singapore. So if we fast forward to today, uh, fundamentally right now we're stuck in a situation where North Korea just does not want to come out to the table, to not even try to discuss or brainstorm even some, any range of possibilities or compromises. And they are insistent that uh, the Trump administration lift UN sanctions first, uh, halt military exercises first, and then maybe I'll consider coming out to the table. So as former negotiators, you've been through this many times before when they won't either pick up the phone or they won't come out to the table. How, how do you, in, in today's context, seeing where we are stuck today, how would you try to bring them out so you can actually have a conversation? Yes, Ambassador Davies. Uh, yeah, uh, look, I mean, I, I, got, I have to come back to pressure. I think uh, with two components, I, th I, I think the international community has to be together on this as much as can be arranged. and. Even players like the Southeast Asians, where I spent some time, have to be brought into it a bit more. Multilateralism, which is not something that I think the current administration is uh, uh, real comfortable with. But I think pressure, the pre you've got to put pressure on them. And here, China becomes key. Uh, and so the, I, I think the, the basic fundamental flaw of the Singapore process was this was the United States acting essentially unilaterally. There were some consultations. But you, you can't crack the nut that way because you've got to involve North Korea's neighbors uh, and the broader international community in sending a unified message to North Korea. You've got to get on with it. You've got to, you've got to respond to these concerns we all have. Ambassador Galushi, you, ha you have a look on your face. I, I, I'm, uh, I'm trying to uh, affect a look here. Uh, I don't think at a time like this, when we are um, five months from a presidential election, North Koreans watch the American domestic political scene very carefully. Uh, they don't know, you know whether there's going to be a second term of this president, whether there's going to be a new presidency. I don't believe the North Koreans have any enthusiasm to come to the table and have a, a negotiation at the working level or any other level. And I think that we should be asking ourselves, what do we want during this five month period? Well, we ought to be giving some thought about what we want to do when the five month period is over. That's what this session, I think, is partly about. It's a good idea for us to look at where we go in the future, but not right now. For right now, I think we have to avoid certain things. I think we have to avoid a situation in which the North concludes that it would be useful for them to jack up their position on our agenda of things to worry about, either whether our means the Trump administration second term or the Democrats coming into office. We don't want them to conclude that it's a good time for adventurism. You know, something in, uh, in the uh, DMZ, something uh, off the coast, some test of a nuclear weapon or a ballistic missile of extended range. We want them to essentially freeze in place. They're going to continue their improvement of ballistic missile uh, engines and technology. They're going to and, and presumably continue to accumulate fissile material, but we don't want any other provocations from the North. I think that's in the near term what we want. Ambassador Chun, what, what should be done now um, until the US presidential elections or should anything be done until the elections? Um, not much, but uh, I think it, as, as uh, Ambassador Galuzzi said, it's important to keep them at bay for the time being. They are trying to, uh, if, if they resume talks, they want to restart talks on their terms. And I see no common ground that can bring U.S. and North Korea together at this point. And as long as there is uh, uncertainty about uh, uh, election 
presidential election result, yeah, they will have no great interest in in talking mm. to the U.S. at this point. So uh, we have to wait out. But so, uh, it's important to prevent to prevent uh, you know situation getting worse. So uh, I think it, sending love letters to Kim Jong Un, stalking him, seeking talks with him, uh, you know, just just keep keep talking to them to um, to uh, take away any pretext for mm. provocation. It's very difficult for North Koreans to to uh, resort to any serious provocation the day after Kim Jong-un received a letter from uh, President Trump. So keep sending letters, you know, seeking talks. That's not, that's I think one way of managing the situation until until the election day. And, uh, but in order to improve the terms and conditions of uh, deal to be worked out afterwards, I think it's important to, while you smile to North Korea, you have to squeeze them further. You have to strangle them further to change their strategic calculus. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to shout at them, but be nice to them while squeezing them and you know, making mm -hmm. their life harder. By Ambassador Hill. Rigorously, rigorously yeah. uh, enforcing sanctions on North Korea. Sanctions, okay, Ambassador Hill. Real quickly, because I agree with everything that's been said uh, on this, but I, I, I would like to emphasize the need that, you know, ultimately, if this problem is ever solved, it's because we found a common language with the ROK and China, other regional countries. And I think we're using this time actually to worsen relations with South Korea, uh, especially mm. through this issue of uh, host country support for U.S. troops. And of course, we've made China the uh, Sort of uh, source of all our of all our enmity, and we're we've been going after China. I think this has not been helpful to uh, a longer term North Korea strategy. And I think to some extent, what we've seen from North Korea the last couple of weeks, which appears to be very much uh, uh, directed at the ROK and directed at the Moon administration, is really directed in an effort to see how far the U.S. and the ROK are in terms of how far apart are they. And uh, I think it's kind of a testing of the alliance. And so far, we're doing very poorly because of uh, President Trump's obsession with this issue of host nation support for our military. Right on that point, Ambassador Chun, so North Korea has been making a lot of noise in the past few days and weeks towards South Korea, basically, I would call basically bullying South Korea and coercing uh, South Korea. What's going on there? Why are they treating South Korea this way? Uh, and do you foresee that North Korea might escalate to some sort of military action? They've, his sister, Kim, uh, Kim Yo-jong, has threatened to even blow up the inter-Korean liaison office that was built between the Moon government and the Kim Jong-un regime. Uh, should we be worried about North Korea blowing up that facility? <laughs> well, blowing up the liaison office is just uh, killing what is dead already. So that's not a big deal. Uh, I think they are, North Koreans are trying to change uh, ROK's policy toward North Korea through intimidation. And they might be surprised that this intimidation uh, works better than they expected. So uh, I think they are, they are very uh, eager to resort to this mm. tactic. But basically, they are very unhappy about, um, about uh, the inter-Korean relations, about uh, uh, the ROK's um, you know, policy toward North Korea. Because President Moon has raised the level of expectations, you know, North Koreans could have believed that ROK would even confront U.S. over sanctions to ease or, or uh, you know, uh, lift sanctions and to uh, resume inter-Korean economic cooperation, all those things that they were, you know, expecting. And nothing is coming from the ROK. And mm -hmm. the direct uh, cause of this uh, uh, confrontation now is the uh, Panmunjom Declaration, which was signed by President Moon and Kim Jong-un two years ago. Panmunjom Declaration specifically commits ROK to ban leaflets 
into North Korea. It, the Pamjong Declaration defines uh, dispatch of leaflets as uh, hostile, as, uh, as hostility toward North Korea. And it specifically bans the leaflets. And for two years, North Korea would believe that the President Moon, uh, uh, Moon Jae-in administration has done nothing. So what they are saying is, you have to abide by the commitment you made in Panmunjom through inter-Korean agreements. If you mm. couldn't keep your promise, why did you make that kind of promise? That's what North Korea is saying. I think basically the problem lies with the ROK's commitment to something that's against the constitutional right of South Koreans the freedom of expression to send their information into North Korea. So whether so, uh, it's whether yeah. it's North Korea escalating to some sort of uh, conventional military act or even uh, waging a more provocative um, gesture, whether it's testing, continuing missile testing uh, and whatnot, do, do any, what do you expect North Korea, it, in the context of the US elections coming up, do you expect North Korea to wage in a, a more aggressive provocation before or around the U.S. elections, or does it not have anything to do with the U.S. elections? Does the October surprise, perhaps it has to do with uh, U.S., South Korea military drills coming up in August, or perhaps it has to do with uh, the 75th anniversary of North Korea's Workers' Party in October. So this October surprise, do, do you foresee something to happen on a larger scale, and what should the Allies do about it to prevent it and to do when, when it happens? Well, uh, about uh, provocations, uh, you know, the people say that uh, barking dog doesn't bite, but there are exceptions, of course. Uh, but if you look at the past pattern, when North Korea is making a, a, a great noise, when, it, when it's very noisy in its uh, uh, criticism, then, you know, they, that usually substitutes for real military action. So I feel safe. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm within the North Korean artillery range now, but I, I don't feel, I don't lose any sleep because of North Korean threats. So, so uh, the louder the bark, the they, less they'll actually they, take physical yeah, action. Their, their threats are cheap, but they are usually more prudent in coming to uh, military provocations because that could uh, bring, bring them a very um, you know, uh, serious humiliation, because actually, if they, if the ROK army fires back, then they will suffer a lot. And mm. uh, you know, they have been telling their people that now that they are nuclear uh, armed, nobody will mess around with North Korea. But if they, if they fire. If they shell uh, and cause any casualties in South Korea, I think the ROK military will retaliate mm. in a proportionate manner, and they they will suffer more than the ROK, and that will I don't know how Kim Jong Un is going to handle the humiliation that that kind of provocation can uh, bring upon North Korea. That's that's something that they will have to consider. And I don't see any particular reason, political reason, to resort to serious provocation like uh, uh, launch of ICBM or a nuclear test uh, before the uh, U.S. presidential election. I think those kind of decisions are basically made on the basis of uh, uh, military imperatives. If they need more tests, for technological development of their ICBMs, uh, taking advantage of the lull in negotiations between US and North Korea, that, that they could do with, with or, without mm -hmm. regard to the election you know, uh, schedule. But I do would, I, I, I would, I'm not very much worried, worried about, they, they don't have anything to gain politically by resorting to such a big strategic provocation and that's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. That can play into President Trump's strategy of uh, election strategy, and that could be very 
uh, dangerous for North Korea. And well, it's, it's going to be a, a very dangerous gamble that Kim Jong-un would play if that, that's what he chooses to do. Before I move on to my final question, what do, do the other ambassadors have anything to add, to dis agree with or disagree with what Ambassador Chana said? Yeah, I, yes. I would I would agree with Ambassador Chan. I think that's I think that's right. I would add to that that given the uh, stakes involved in the U.S. presidential election um, and the nature of our current uh, leadership, uh, there is an extra risk I think that attaches to North Korea um, engaging in provocations of any sort that are directed at the United States of America, uh, because mm -hmm. I would I wouldn't want to guess what sorts of reactions might come in a tweet or, you know, uh, in a moment of peak out, uh, mm. out, of, out of the White House. That's, a, that, that's a, a bit of a worry I have. I think in terms of Kim Jong-un, uh, it would be completely according to the pattern of their behavior in the past that in the run-up to our elections or afterward, uh, he would do something just to remind everybody that, that uh, you know, North Korea still remains uh, uh, a force to be reckoned with. Uh, and so I think he, there is that impetus for him to, to do something of some sort. And, and I would hope it wouldn't be kinetic, so-called. I would hope it would be only symbolic. Okay. Yes. I'm, I would just like to add that uh, I, I really do believe that what they're doing is more political. They're trying to uh, kind of humiliate the South Korean government and they're trying to sort of open up more gaps between the ROK and the U.S. Uh, I think, I mean, this is perhaps a little unfair because I don't have a lot of evidence for this. I think the North Koreans are quite happy with the Trump administration and would like to see four more years of it. And to accomplish that means that they cannot go into this uh, military or, or as, as Glenn said, kinetic uh, type response, but uh, certainly um, trying to create uh, problems between the U.S. and the ROK. Um, that's an ongoing process, and I think they can be very satisfied at the idea that the U.S. and the ROK are not as close as they were when the Trump administration started. So I, I think we need to keep our eye on the issue, on the cohesion of the alliance. They would like to see sanctions relaxed, and but to do that, they have to work closely with the Chinese, and the Chinese have made it very clear they don't want any huge pro, uh, provocative testing of that kind. Before I turn it over to audience Q&A, very briefly, uh, so especially in the East Asian context, process and format is many times just as important as the content and the substance. I personally uh, don't mind the summit process, summit tree, as long as there's, um, you know, a real strategy and good preparation involved. But is it time for, you know, Ambassador Hill, you mentioned several times I need to bring the Chinese involved uh, more formally. Do we need a different process, a different format, different geometrical, geometrical shape or configuration of what these talks look like and who gets to sit at the table for these negotiations? Yes. So I don't want to stake out a position that's at odds with my colleagues who I think are all um, enthusiastic about a multilateral approach to the North Korea problem. However, um, it had been my view when we conducted essentially bilateral negotiations with the North Koreans that that was the essential engagement that we would want, of course, the, our allies in South Korea very close to us. And we debriefed every single day that we had a negotiation. We debriefed with the ROK reps who were in Geneva. We briefed, debriefed all the time with both uh, the mission in, from Beijing and the mission from Tokyo. Um, mm. I, I think what I'm getting to here is that North Koreans have told me quite clearly that they at different points have favored six party talks, other points opposed six party talks, wanted it to be bilateral, but in either case, whatever they may choose that they favor, what context, um, there's a fundamental um, exchange that needs to take place 
I think, about normalization and denuclearization, and that's between the DPRK and the USA. And that had been my focus and still is. I, I think if we have a regional, an outcome which is regionally embraced, it's much more likely to be durable. There are all kinds of other pluses to that, including sustaining our alliances with Seoul and, and Tokyo. But I, I, I want to be, I would want to be careful not to mistake the modality for the central engagement, which ha I think has to be Pyongyang, Washington. Okay. Yes, Ambassador Chan. Yeah. 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 ROK, China, you know, we are all major stakeholders uh, on denuclearization, on peace and security of the Korean Peninsula. We are the owners. But, um, you know, uh, in terms of uh, negotiations, U.S. owns most of the assets that North Korea needs in return for denuclearization. And for North Korea, the only country that matters in the world is the U.S. China doesn't matter to them to a certain extent, but uh, compared to U.S., China doesn't really uh, weigh that much in North Korea's calculations. China doesn't have anything to much to give North Korea in return for North Korea's denuclearization. All those things, you know, new relations, peace, peace regime, security guarantees, these are things that U.S. alone can provide to North Korea. So I wouldn't mind uh, that you know, the negotiations are conducted between you know, U.S. and North Korea. But uh, as in the Six Party Talks, you know, the final agreement could be endorsed by the other stakeholders. They could be underwriters, you know, just guarantors of uh, implementation in whatever capacity. So they, they could be involved uh, in due time to uh, add credibility to any mm -hmm. agreement that comes out of the bilateral discussions. Okay. Anyone else very briefly, or I can turn it over to audience questions. I'd just like to say, I think the North Korean uh, raison d'etre is much more offensive and aggressive than we've been describing. And I think mm -hmm. they for a period where the US is kind of decoupled from South Korea, where we're less of a factor, where we outsource our diplomacy to someone else. And uh, I would like to see, I, I think they would like to see us just less interested in the ROK alliance. I think a big part of their effort is to weaken our alliance. And, uh, um, and I agree, China can't do for them what we can do for them. But I think China's key factor in terms of saying to the North Koreans, no testing or else. And uh, I think they have more credibility there. You know, this whole thing about, we always say China can solve it, the Chinese say we can solve it. The answer is probably both of us uh, together, mm -hmm. especially with the ROK. So uh, yeah, I'm a pretty convinced uh, multilateralist. I don't like to see us just do it bilaterally because half the world says we're being unreasonable. The other half says North Korea is being unreasonable. I don't think, I sort of like the odds of five on one rather than one on one. Okay. I've got one more quick point. Okay, yes. On the human rights issue, just to say that yes. I think ways ought to be found to continue to keep that uh, up, uh, up in lights uh, so that people understand more fundamentally, because they don't know in many parts of the world the fundamental nature of this regime and what it's done to its people. And I, and, and I think that's, that's a way to illustrate to a broader audience what the stakes are here in trying to resolve okay. this. Thank you, that's, that's an important point. We will now turn it over to the audience. So we already have a bunch lined up. Um, and I'll try to get to as many as we can in the time allotted. Forgive me, forgive us if we can't answer all of them. In the interest of time, I will um, lump a few together uh, and pose them to the speakers and you can the speakers can choose which ones that they would like to answer. Uh, the first, and some of the, there are some, um, repetitions here, so I'm going to um, tweak some of these accordingly. The first question is from George Lopez. What, and this is for anybody, uh, what uh, should the role of economic sanctions be 
in achieving negotiate, uh, negotiating negotiation goals. And this is from George Lopez at the University of Notre Dame. Glenn Fukushima asks, and Glenn Fukushima and Robert Einhorn, both of their questions are, are similar, so I'm going to lump those two together. Assuming a Biden administration comes into office in January, I'm sorry, Glenn, I'm gonna tweak this. What is just one thing that you would like to advise um, candidate Joe Biden if he becomes president? And if anything, is there something you, that the, a potential Biden administration should keep that Trump did? Uh, Bob Einhorn, a similar question, but um, should the next, in 2021, whoever the president is, should the president pursue an interim deal that would verifiably cap North Korea's nuclear capability and commit the, uh, the parties to eventually achieve denuclearization, but without specifying a date? for achieving that goal or insist on a roadmap, a comprehensive roadmap uh, that would get complete denuclearization de by an agreed date uh, or something else. So his question is more on the sequencing. Um, <clears throat> there's another question also similar but from Ronald Chang at TBS. Again, if, Biden, if uh, Joe Biden is elected, um, will the US go back to the strategic patience that the Obama administration pursued with North Korea? So whoever would like to take, they were not um, directed at any particular person. You can choose which ones you'd like to answer. Yes, Bob. So I, I, the question I liked most was <laughs> what would President Biden um, best do to deal with this problem? Uh, I like the question because I like the assumption here that he will have an opportunity <laughs> uh, to, to do this thing. Uh, I, I would like him to start uh, in his reaction to the Korea case with the normal, I don't want to say platitudes, but necessary uh, comments about, uh, uh, about how important the issue is. But make clear first that the, his administration will be committed as past American administrations have been to the denuclearization of North Korea. That that's um, what we regard as part of normalization, a first point. A second point um, is to say that a normal relationship between the USA and the DPRK is one in which the DPRK has done something serious about changing its human rights policy, to go back to Glenn's point. Um, that a normal relation, be, uh, normal relations mm. between the United States and another country that um, runs gulags and violates even the most minimal standards, international standards, human rights, is implausible politically. And the North Koreans actually know that, I think, though they don't particularly like to hear it. But I'd like that up front, along with denuclearization. If those two things are made clear, I think then the administration can go and say, um, as long as we're clear about the goals that the US is committed to achieving on the Korean Peninsula, then we want to make clear that we want to engage in a negotiation. And we do think that step, step by step, reciprocity, action for action, whatever one likes, is in fact the way the two of us need to proceed given our lack of trust of each other demonstrated over the last few decades. Uh, and that we have prepared for this to take some time. Um, I don't know whether we need a specific roadmap, but we need some substance up front with respect to both um, both points, both on the normalization side and on the side of, of denuclearization. Uh, so if we, if we were clear about that and we gave over the obligations to execute this to, to working level uh, negotiators, I think that would be the, the right course, not excluding symmetry, but uh, not leading with symmetry mm. uh, and being clear and if, you, if you're not clear, and this is a, a point, since one of the questions came from Bob Einhorn, if you're not clear about our goal of denuclearization and that we're not talking about geologic time frames here, uh, we're talking about a reasonable amount of time um, for things to work out. If you're not clear about that, then it may look like we are satisfied with this plateau in which North Korea is a nuclear weapon state. And we don't want to project that for a variety of very good reasons. 
We, we need that to change, but we're prepared to work towards that in a gradual a reciprocal method, modality. Okay. Uh, Ambassador Chan, would you like to take any of those questions? It's okay yeah, if well, you don't. I, I don't remember all the questions. It's okay. Um, I can, uh, I can uh, uh, answer the question on sanctions, the role of sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, but if we can resolve uh, this problem without sanctions, that would be best. But uh, I think this is the, the sanctions are the only hope that we can uh, to Christ North Korea, if ever. So uh, the message is 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 just to 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 uh, convince North Korea that without denuclearization, there is no hope for economic development. They will be denied a uh, chance for economic development. That's that's the the role of sanctions. Because but you're not you're not saying that sanctions is the solution is the key that will lead to denuclearization. Yeah, that's not what that's you're right. saying. That, that, yeah. Sanctions just raise costs of keeping yeah. their nuclear weapons to keep their nuclear arsenal. They have to the, the price they pay is sanctions. And uh, uh, well, I don't think that sanctions can be enforced to the point of. Uh, uh, denying North Korea's political survival. That would be very difficult to do, but at least we can deny them uh, economic development. So unless you uh, you uh, denuclearize, you will have no economic development. That's that's the, the crux of the message that we are sending to North Korea. And North Korea doesn't, cannot survive uh, with nuclear weapons alone, they need in the long term. Without economic development, they have no future. So it will take time, but and nobody wants to see North Koreans suffer, especially the uh, North Korean civilians suffer because of sanctions. The collateral damage that uh, is uh, actually, uh, you know, inflicted to the civilians. But this is the price they have to pay. Otherwise, uh, they will have no incentives to denuclearize. And I, as I said earlier, uh, the denuclearization should be done in parallel with other steps that U.S. has promised in terms of uh, abandonment of Hassad policy, the three items that the U.S. promised, right? So mm -hmm. peace regime security guarantees, they can be uh, negotiated when uh, the roadmap for denuclearization is negotiated. All those things have to be negotiated, but peace regime or security guarantees or new diplomatic, rela diplomatic relations with, the, with the North Korea, they can come into effect on the date that denuclearization is verifiably completed. You, you can work out the documents, you know, while uh, you work on the uh, roadmap for denuclearization. So all these things can move together. And uh, okay. you know, we, we cannot just uh, do away with incremental approach, but we should never give up the goal of denuclearization. No disarmament, but the final goal should be denuclearization. No, no peace treaty will come into force until uh, they fully denuclearize. Uh, did the other amb Ambassador Hill and uh, Davies, did you have comments or should I move on to? Well, let me, just, let me just say, I think the elephant in the room that we really don't want to talk about is the degree of damage, outright damage to US interests in the world caused by the, our current administration. Our current administration has felt quite comfortable withdrawing from parts of the world, undermining age-old alliances, and otherwise uh, appearing not to care about these issues. I think, therefore, assuming we get a new administration, we need that administration to, first of all, reaffirm the U.S. not only interest in the world, but also commitment to being a player in the world 
and that goes for me for especially for Northeast Asia. So I would look for in the context I would look for um, better relations with the ROK and frankly a better working relationship with China. Uh, the problem with the uh, as we say China bashing it happens every four years but there's something qualitatively different. No question the Chinese have misbehaved but we need to understand that uh, one sixth of humanity cannot be ignored and we need to have a working relationship with China. So uh, beyond that, I completely agree with the notion that we need to be very clear with the North Koreans. We will not accept a nuclear North Korea for a whole lot of reasons, as Bob said. But I think we also need to be very committed to trying to do something about it. And therefore, I don't see any strategic, any scope for strategic patience or uh, whatever one wants to call it. I think we need to work very closely with our partners in the region. And as for sanctions, I've never been a big supporter of sanctions, but I think uh, uh, they are something that must be continued. If we got to the point where we could contemplate a more a normalization of the US, or, uh, US uh, uh, North Korea relationship, we need to address these issues of human rights. I mean, this is probably the world's worst uh, uh, human rights offender, uh, and we do need to address these. But I do believe that the nuclear weapons are a, pr a clear and present danger to the region and to the United States. And I think a new administration needs to show a new commitment. And rather than uh, um, diplomacy through press conferences and through snide remarks, which is what we get every day of the week from our dyspeptic uh, Secretary of State and our clueless president. Sorry to be so frank. And I, I would just say that, practically sure. speaking, what this means is that I think a president, a new, that the incoming president, uh, whether it's uh, our current uh, incumbent or, or, or Biden, uh, should find ways to signal first privately uh, and then publicly a continuing attention to and interest in resolving this issue first and foremost, because I think you, you do want to avoid uh, North Korea feeling as if it's been pushed off the table uh, in order to, as a sort of a prophylactic measure. Um, and so I would hope that uh, there's room in all of the many thousands of issues a, a new uh, president come, has coming in or an incumbent coming back in to repeat some of these messages first privately and then and publicly. Okay, we only have time for uh, our last questions. Our speakers can choose which ones. Uh, Jesse Johnson with the Japan Times uh, points out that, <laughs> excuse me, uh, that Kim Jong-un actually has left room to open to have a discussion with Trump. So he's basically separate compartmentalizing Kim, uh, Trump and the rest of America. Uh, so in this context, what do you think Kim Jong-un is after? Uh, what do you think Kim Jong-un wants uh, from the United States? Um, and another question from Richard Johnson, how do you empower actual negotiators? Uh, the North Korean side, the negotiators clear, are not, clearly are not empowered to negotiate, to, have, to actually have room to negotiate. Uh, and so how do you do that with um, a Kim Jong-un regime that only Chairman Kim uh, can talk about and decide on the nuclear, um, the nuclear uh, issue? And final question, I'm sorry, everybody in the audience, these are excellent questions, though, is from Frank Um at USIP. Uh, can North Korea be pressured if, one, China is unwilling to apply the necessary pressure, two, other countries are unable or unwilling, and three, North Korea believes it has the upper hand? So real quick, we've got two minutes left. So to the, to the first, first question, I can see nothing good coming out of a uh, chairman president meeting before the election. Uh, that would be a desperate president uh, and not a good idea. I mean, it's not, wasn't a good idea when he wasn't desperate. So I think it's an especially bad idea right now. Um, second, how do you empower a negotiator? You say, this is my negotiator. For the, on the North Korean side, uh, I don't think we had much concern uh, uh, about Kang Sok Chu. He had a direct line uh, to both uh, uh, King Chum Yeo and, and Kim Il-sung. So I, I don't think that that's a major problem. 
But I, I do hope we wait for either the second Trump administration, not my favorite outcome, or the new Biden administration. Ambassador Hill. Well, I associate myself with, uh, with all of that. Uh, we certainly don't need another um, show of a summit meeting. And uh, Bob's quite right. If you, if you empower a negotiator, you simply have to say it. Uh, ideally, you, uh, it takes about 125th of a second, depending on the lighting conditions, but uh, <laughs> not be a you know, meeting between the president and the negotiator, and the negotiator needs to be backed up. This, by the way, is an, has been an elusive concept at times on the U.S. side, whereas I never had a concern that the North Koreans had the wrong people in front of me. Uh, uh, I always felt that they kind of were all together in, in how they viewed these things. Uh, but I really do believe that we need to have a more serious, comprehensive approach to this. And North Korea doesn't happen in a vacuum in the region. And that's why I want to see much more of a pivot, if you will, to uh, Northeast Asia, an effort to try to bring our allies together and uh, have a productive dialogue with the Chinese. Mm. Real quick, Ambassador Chun and Ambassador Davies, we are running out of time. Uh, I, I'll just say I'm in violent agreement with everything that's been said. I think that, that all makes perfect sense. Okay. Ambassador Chun, final words. Yeah. Well, I was just mentioning about how to empower the negotiators. I think we need uh, uh, negotiators who, who can report directly to the president, to the, lead, to the top leader, and uh, receive instructions directly from, from uh, from him or her. So uh, that's very important. If, you, if there are too many chefs in the kitchen mm -hmm. interfering with your you know, negotiating job, then the negotiation will go nowhere. So one advantage I had was that I could report directly to the president and receive, the president gave me a full mandate. So I didn't have to seek instruct, instructions every now and then. So I thought that was very important for me. I could talk to Kim Gyegan, you know, without seeking instructions from, from, uh, from headquarters. So mm. empowering uh, negotiators is very important because all those details have to be worked out at expert level. And if they just go up to the presidential level without sufficient working level preparation that it could produce disaster like in Singapore very dangerous to, to uh, get the top leaders directly engaged in negotiations without you know, preparing the ground for a successful outcome. Well, on that very important note, we can talk for days, weeks, and months, and years on all of these topics, but unfortunately, we are out of time. I would like to give um, a very warm thank you very much to all of our ambassadors who have joined from near and far at odd hours of the morning and evening, and to all of our audience, our attendees who have also joined from all across the globe. Thank you so much, and we're very sorry we cannot answer all of your questions, but I'm sure there are ways to uh, get in touch with our speakers to seek their insights. And uh, I hope to have all of you back sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dion. Great chat. Thank you. Bye-bye.